just think of H E A L T H, then you'll be able to, you know, apply these things on a day to day basis. So let's move on with the slide. So, with healthy eating, you all know about that, and I don't have to take calls in Newcastle, but it's very simply, you know, look at food that is natural and colored and avoid what is processed. And of course, especially omega-3 and enough water is very useful in the pandemic. And we need our vitamin D. More and more people are talking about vitamin D, especially in people of color. More of us are staying inside. And vitamin D is very important for our immune system. So even though I talk about eating, going in the sunlight is our way of eating vitamin D. Let's put it that way. Then there is active living, many aspects to it. Exercise is one of the best things that one can do for one's health and for one's for depression, for one's mind. And if 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 you you know if you do exercise as the center of your lifestyle, you are going to feel a massive difference. As difficult as it may be to keep it up. And then recreation is important. To be able to have fun, to be able to get close to nature, even though we have this distancing. We can still look at the mountains. Some of us have gardens um, or find some way to, you know, look at it, even look at the stars in the night, you know, but connect to nature. Don't let the lockdown prevent that. And we can be involved in play, table games. It's a time for the family to come together and table games in charades, concerts, and movies, family movies. And I'm finding that, you know, very often families come together more. It may, may be conflict sometimes, but, you know, more often it can be positive. That we spend more time, a, a good spin off of the pandemic. Hobbies are very important for everyone. You have a sense of accomplishment when you do something creative. If you can do craft, photography, have a pet, do gardening, which we will need now because we're going to need food. Uh, so, all these things. Enjoy music. Music is very relaxing, you know, and reading. I can assure you that, you know, active living of exercise and recreation and hobbies will help you to feel better with this burnout. And then there is togetherness, reaching out to others. We, all of us need mutual support, not just one side. We need to with positive people, not negative. People who will listen and people who will empathize. It makes a world of difference. And of course, because of social distance, you know, we have to learn the technology. Some of us didn't learn how to make WhatsApp groups or to use our own Zoom and all of that, but now we are experts. It's important to volunteer, and I know many of us do that, to help with the elderly and the less fortunate, uh, people, other people who may live alone for different reasons. And that gives us again a sense of purpose and increases our endorphins. Reaching out not only to others, but to God. Uh, and you know that um, the matter of having time apart from everything, for scripture, for prayer, for worship. Um, and, you know, it is said that faith is most active and most real when it is dark, because the late Vice President Biden who made that comment. And gratitude and forgiveness are also very important in dealing with our own stresses to prevent burnout. So let's move on now to hanging loose. 
We need sleep. We need our eight hours for good immune system and for resilience. I know Dr. Camp is going to speak about the three hours of relaxation. So I'm showing them to you. Let's look on that. Deep breathing relaxation. Let's look at the next slide. Um, and you see some features there that you can just look at it. But, um, but the thing is that deep breathing exercise, it moves from the sympathetic to the parasympathetic nervous system of quieting. And that can help our anxiety. It can help hypertension. It can help us to focus better. And indeed, it boosts our immune system. Next one. Next one, please. Next slide. Yes. Now, other aspects of hanging loose. Meditation. Take time from yourself, from everything. Lock up in your room sometimes and play some nice music, probably on YouTube, meditation music and do that and reflect, you know, on what's going on and how, what, how we can make things better or how God can make things better. Somebody spoke earlier on about humor, having a good belly laugh. As in Jamaica, we say the bad things make joke and that's how Jamaicans very often survive. Um, we need the news, yes, and we need the technology, but sometimes we have to go easy, don't overdo it. And um, of course, we spoke about how some people can abuse alcohol and other substances. We're not going to do that. Um, on the job, it's important now that we take many breaks in between patients. Sometimes this is may not be possible in the hospital or ICU situation. But even then, we're going to need it if we're not going to drop down. Now we need to set priorities. What are the priorities um, in our lives? And we need to set boundaries between work time on one hand and what we call me time, we time, and God time. Those times are sacrosanct. If we can, if we can keep those times and balance it to the work time, that will lessen the chances of burnout. We need to um, reframe how we deal with work. Sometimes we need to focus back on the positive aspects, you know, sometimes being able to share with others um, and the support of others. Uh, we need to look again, is my approach the best? What other approach I could take? But even with that reframing, Sometimes we just come to the point where we recognize that, you know, the upshot is going to be our downfall in this workplace. We're in a toxic workplace. People are not taking us seriously. Things are not going to get worse. And sometimes we just have to leave to survive that burnout does not destroy us. Next. Next. Now, so we have seen that H E A L T H, these lifestyles, that for certain we are sure that is going to help our immunity. All of us is going to help our immunity. It's going to relieve anxiety and depression. It's going to prevent, improve the chronic diseases you may have, or prevent chronic diseases, and it's going to give us purpose, connection, and faith. All right, let's move on. Taking control of the crisis. Now, having looked at the context, the many aspects of what is involved in being at the front line, the hazards, the undersupply, etc. And the fears and trauma and so on. Um, having looked at 
how to build our resilience and through team and our own efforts, self-care, uh, and to recognize burnout. And the thing is, what about the future? I don't know how long this COVID, this COVID era is going to last. You know, HIV era is still here, but we have to find ways to suppress it. And they speak about vaccine and so on, and how long that is going to take. But I think that one of the things that we have to look at is the need to become change agents. Um, viruses have a right to live on this planet with us, but you know, they may have their right, but they do have a right to be with us. And I think foundational to the pandemics in the past and present is the matter of human rights and the matter of justice. In other words, the pandemic is as much a human problem as anything else. And justice and human rights leads to the ordering of societies, where societies that can become integrated to work for the happiness and the wellness of all. This might sound idealistic, but at least we all should have goals and a positive mindset in this direction. Next, please. Now, I think that the disintegration of life in our society have led to several shattered pieces that, that I think are the vectors of the virus and also the agents. Um, but I think let's look first of all at, the, at what is causing this disintegration. We have economic in, in, um, inequity. We have, you know, due to materialism, greed, we're in a consumption society. And each of us is seen as a unit to consume. Nobody is thinking about our good. And um, consumerism and commercial entities, you know, have captured our minds. There's a neglect of morals in our living choices, political convenience, dereliction of justice, social divisions. Who are the people who are dying most of in the United States? African American, black and brown people. You know, poor people who have to work in the sweatshops of the meat shops and you know older people who are in the nursing homes etc so we have all these social um, divisions that are part of this and then this problem there, there's there's a global warming and of course increased proximity to wild animals due to mismanagement of the environment now the how did all of these then, this, this um, disequilibrium in the society, how does it provide vectors? For some of the vectors now, let's move on. Slide, next slide. Um, yes, go back. Yes. So the first vector is the fact of chronic diseases, because these are the people who are some of the, the main victims. The virus is coming into an unhealthy body. And 70% of chronic diseases are preventable. We have been neglecting this, so the virus is now having a field day. Then we have, you know, poverty which has been neglected. Homelessness, nursing homes, the sweatshops that I spoke about. Next one. Then there is the vector of chronic mental illness. And you know that mental illness is the type of illness that produces the worst suffering, the highest burden of disease um, on the planet. And people are saying that 
you know, part of this pandemic is not only going to be an emotional pandemic, but a, a pandemic of mental health. And already we heard the last people speaking about this. Uh, and then there's the threatened silence of public health science. And this is going on right in the United States right now where people are being um, silenced in, in many ways. And there's the conflict of political and commercial interests, which is, you know, compromising supply. Move on, please. Next one, please. And then there's the aspect of this, the distorted healthcare system. That I think is a very big issue. And if you come back to the fact of why is it that so many doctors are burnt out? We lack universal care. Um, well, not Jamaica, but in other countries. In Jamaica, we say we have health care for all, but then look at the standards. Uh, and, you know, very often we can't get drugs and all sorts of difficult conditions that contribute to burnout. There, not enough people have um, insurance. Too often business has become, medicine has become a business. So it's the insurance companies that dictate, it's the owners of um, hospital complexes and um, other persons um, who are in the administration and the selling of medical services. So it becomes too much business and inadequately based on public health measures, healthy lifestyles. And we also neglect a biopsychosocial approach. Next, please. Next slide. Now, these vectors are also the agents of burnout. It's all these things that contribute to burnout. Next. Now, we face a moral hazard. The fact is that, you know, the baker, the brewer, um, were, they were principals in what they did centuries ago. And so the doctor, we were principals. But then we had agents who were coming in to help to expand our services to meet a greater number of people. So you have the agents, you know, the state uh, providing state care, or using us, the agent of you know, the private sector using our services and other agents um, that use our care. But then what has happened is that Agents are taken over from the principles, and we have come to a, a, a situation of what we call moral hazard, where the agents who mediate um, the services of the principles act in bad faith. So where there is an imbalance now between cost and benefits in the services that people receive, and this is what we're talking about. As you know. The, the overuse and the undersupply that's causing this burnout. And it's called a moral hazard that is faced by both the principal, the doctor, and the patients who he or she serves. Next one, please. So as we face these vectors and the moral hazard, what are we going to do? Next, please. We have to advocate for a just society and a society where human rights become paramount. Now, we as doctors can't just sit in our chair, but we have to get out on the street, as it were, become advocates. We have to, through our associations, um, CCCP, the Family 
practice, uh, general practitioners association, nurses association, and so on. We have to look after our, our own interests, but indeed, if we have better conditions, then it will help us too to prevent burnout. That's the whole point. Um, so we have to go through the media. We have to educate public, private, and non-governmental organizations uh, about you know the need for equity, the need for proper health care, and where the whole society they become the guardians for the patients and for the well-being of the doctors. If necessary, as has happened in the United States, where we have seen nurses out there protesting and doctors. Um, recently, we have had a whistleblower, the doctor in the US that he was responsible for producing vaccines. So we may have to become whistleblowers as advocates. Next, please. So, we then, in dealing with this situation of burnout, we have said that we need to really understand what is happening, grasp it, and then we need to take charge to build our own resilience and to, to, to diagnose ourselves, know what's happening to us. And then we also have to be change agents for a just global society with human rights and the person's happiness and wellness coming first. Next. Next slide. And let it not be because of our silence why we burn out. It is said that the candle of truth challenges the darkness the candle of truth. So we need to speak the truth. Martin Luther King once said that the arc of the moral universe may seem long, it's long, but it bends to our justice. Let us work for that. Next one, please. Next slide. Thank you for listening. And I want us that when we leave to reflect where we are, what is the context. Let us reflect how we're feeling, uh, you know, what's happening to us. And then let us deal with, as I say now, here is to your H-E-A-L-T. Here is to your health at this time of physician burnout. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Allen. Any questions for Dr. Allen, please? Any questions? No question. I take it that the presentation was very clear and that people didn't have any difficulty. Uh, Dr. Allen? Okay. My apology, I understand there is a question. Thank you very much, Dr. Allen, for an excellent and comprehensive presentation. I just wondered um, in terms of burnt out, especially your last points about becoming change agents ourselves. Um, does that mean we leave our profession and go into the polit politics of health? And um, Looking back after all these years of practice yourself, do you think there is a, a role that you know, we need to create organizations that work for advocacy um, for both patients and doctors? Thank you. It's interesting when you look at the United States because 
we have to understand the virus. It is this virus that is running things. It's not the politicians or the, the commercial people who want everybody to go out so they can make the money. <laughs> you know, it's a virus with running things. And the, 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 what's going to happen? It's going to take about two years, but how all of us fear and do is going to depend on the science. So we as doctors, we have a lot of science to protect in this pandemic. We also, also used to have the science of smoking. Uh, we have done a lot of, of, of advocacy. Um, the cigarette companies did a big fight back and some the last minister of health got at him. Um, there are some doctors in government service, I think, who have been penalized because they speak out about certain things. But, you know, when they start talking about soft drinks, remember again, there was a fight there. Uh, so it is when we speak out, and the Minister of Health, thank God, has been speaking about moves and all these things. But that is where health is going to improve and less burnout. Because we are the ones who have the science. We have the truth. And this truth shall make you free. And we have to find ways to get it out. Because we are going to be competing with the voices of politicians who want the power. You know, and they are convenient. And also the voices of the private sector, which as we know, they work very much for the meat, food, and the processed food, and all these things that are making us sick. I hope I've answered your question. We're going to have Hello. to become creative and take risks. Hello. Hello, Madam Chair. Hello. Madam Chair, Dr. Persaud. Dr. Persaud, before you continue, let me tell, uh, allow Dr. Allen know that Maxine Cargill especially appreciated the presentation. And I think all of us thought it was good. Go ahead. Yes, um, I thank you very much, Dr. Tony, for such a wonderful talk. My, my observation, as you said, take control. In your talk, we have to recognize and we have to have resilience building. And um, there's a quote that I know, and it goes like this. Things always turn out the best for those who make the best of the way things turn out. <laughs> I totally, <laughs> I totally agree, I I totally, totally agree with you that we have to take our opportunity for ourselves, strengthening ourselves and the resilience because doctors are in the front line and they are really making a lot of sacrifice. A number of yeah. our colleagues have died and we really do think that um, we have to focus and I like the idea of going out as messengers, as practitioners, to as much as we can influence people to understand how the way they behave and to help them to, to know that the line is not going to move any faster by keeping six feet away. You're moving even faster by less crowding and saving a lot of lives. Exactly. I thank you. But the more of us need to be writing in the paper, in simple, language about what social distance. I don't think the public understand this virus thing, you know, and, and how it works, and about the, how far the particles travel, you know? And I think if it is explained to them that somebody could be sitting in a, in a seat on a bus, and the particles are all the, uh, around them, and they get up, and somebody has to sit in that seat, and become infected, <laughs> you know. That's what we really need to, you know, don't just depend on the, the police to try to, you know, get people to wear a mask or whatever. I think we as doctors now need to find ways to talk to people, you know, in churches, in schools, wherever, um, offices, whatever, to let them really understand. Because in America, what's happening now, you see the the, the, the governors, many of the governors now are being pressed, the Republicans, to open up, open up. But the people themselves, 
looking out for themselves and they're saying, no, we're not going to do it. And the more people are looking to science and looking to truth, they are going to be, be, be less affected by this virus. Can I have a word? This is Dr. Sloper here. Yes. Yes, um, Tony. Uh-huh. I'm not very used to Zoom, so this is the first time on it. Um, excellent talk. Gosh, that was politics, economics, everything rolled into one. Um, I really was pleased with it. Thank you. Um, Good to hear you. And nice, nice to, you know, I'm in England at the moment. I've been ill. Oh, Lord of mercy. I've been on that. I've been under lockdown really for since since November when I arrived for investigation, and then oh we got heaven, so, yeah, so you're right in the middle of it over there. I'm in the middle of it, and I'm a vulnerable person, so I'm shielded at home. Um, yes, day. Um, and I have had very little energy, but that's mostly because I've been ill. But I've been reading yes. a lot of comments from people about how they said they do, they learn a language, they they paint the house, they do this, they do that yet they can't bring themselves to do anything. And then I read a psychologist's comment stating that we're using so much mental energy to deal with this horrendous, invisible, unknown threat that has changed the whole world in a month or two, that we're using so much energy to defend ourselves from our feelings, that that's why we don't have the mental energy to do all of these things we thought we might do or the newspaper articles tell us we should be doing. What's your take on that? You know, it might sound strange, but um, I think of myself like, you know, probably being in a hole mm -hmm. and we might panic, but then we have to look around and see if we find a little rock or something and what we can do moment by moment. So I think we have to take it day by day mm -hmm. instead of trying to, to think about And I think that the media is, is, is affecting us too much about when can we open up and all this, this stuff, you know. But if we can on a day by day basis, what can I do to make today meaningful through, you know, H-E-A-L-T-H. Um, what, lit, what, what are the small ways? So instead of looking at the big picture, when will this end? We take it on a day by day basis. And then we pace ourselves. We take times for rest and just, you know, close the windows, everything. And then we go back to what we can do um, for a balanced life during that day on a day by day basis because to think beyond that, it can blow our minds. That's right. Thank but you. I, I am optimistic, you know. You know why? Mm -hmm. I believe in the potential of the human being. I believe we are bigger than this virus. I believe we can overcome. And we could have prevented it. <laughs> you know? So if we can deal with these factors, little by little, over time, Remember I said the war took between four and six years. So I'm optimistic that in two or three years, um, and even beginning now, people are going to come out. If we can have a people movement. So I'm optimistic, and this is really helping to keep me going. And of course, from a spiritual point of view, I'm also optimistic that you know, if I surrender myself to the universe, to the higher power, to the good Lord, that at least that state of mind can help my immune system and help my coping ability as well. Do we have it? One last question for Dr. Buckland. Dr. Adit Buckland. Thank you very much. What an excellent presentation. Thank you so much. And it's lovely to hear from Mary and to see all of you um, doing your part, doctors on the front line. Um, for me, 
sometimes if I feel stuck, I really have to stay in the moment. I'm not in the past. I'm not in the future. I just have to stay in this moment and bless the moment and ask, plug into Almighty Power and say, Lord, just take me through this. And for the next 10 minutes, there's something that maybe I've been delaying on. I would just, let me see what I can do in the next 10 minutes on this. And I find that once I stick to just the first 10 minutes of something, I find that I have um, generated some momentum to go another 10 minutes on the particular top, whatever it is I'm working on. And then I find that, um, that I get through it. And then I also, I will call for backup. You know, I may say, you know, hey, I may call someone, say, could you help me with this? Could you help me with that? Because um, no man is an island. We need each yes. other. We really need each other. And it's important to plug into the Almighty. Because life, we, we live life now. This is what we have. This is what is promised. We have now and we're grateful for it. And we bless each other in now. Thank you so much. Yes. Dr. Buckland is talking about um, mindfulness. Where, you know, when you're eating, many of us do, you know, do a jar of food. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't use any stuff on my vegetables. But I know, enjoy the taste of the vegetable. You know, so you eat and you eat slowly, you enjoy your food. You listen to, I know, listen to music and I enjoy the moment of it. If I'm watching a movie, if I'm talking to someone, so living in the moment, enjoying it, then that makes a difference. And, you know, I've had people, friends call me, who I've not heard from in 10 years, <laughs> you know, but just that connecting and feeling connected. For some of us, it's more difficult. We wouldn't have to make a greater effort. We are people who just stick to ourselves. We can't do it now. We just have to push ourselves to, to reach out. And what I recommend, some of us know people you know, and we know they are quiet. They don't call us. And normally we wouldn't call them. But if we know somebody who probably lives alone or, you know, who we know would welcome a call. Let's call such a person, you know, and be prepared to listen. Somebody called me the other night, you know, going through a very difficult time as a colleague. So, you know, we are there for one another. And I find that is extremely important. Mindfulness and um, connectedness. Um, we have one more question from Dr. Bell. Let's accommodate that question before we move on. Dr. Bell, go ahead, please. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm trying to find my <laughs> what I wrote. Um, but there are those of us who work for um, different institutions, etc., and there are times. We speak out, um, offering what we consider helpful or um, evidence-based uh, guidelines or something like that. And uh, it starts up the modus operandi. How would or how should we react then? Or especially if we know that our jobs might be threatened when we speak out and sort of be challenging the norm? I think this is where associations come in. The Med Medical Association of Jamaica, um, the um, Caribbean Conference of Family Practitioners, Association of General Practitioners, and other groups. Jamaican Psychiatric Association, etc. I think if we can speak as groups of physicians, um, make an official statement and put it out there in the public, um, you know, I, I don't see that 
the powers that be can get at any one particular person, hopefully. Um, but I think this is where you power lies in unity. Uh, because you see, uh, looking at the US, look at the unity of the Republican Party, <laughs> you know. Um, and it's, it's that type of, it's perverse, but that type, sorry, well, I, I hope no, I'm not speaking to any Republicans, but, but that type of negative unity around and negative tropes uh, has power in itself. So I think the power for truth and science, if there is unity among us, uh, where we speak with one voice, I think that will give us a special strength. And I think there's a thing, there's things such as white papers and green papers or policy papers, position papers, you know, news releases and that type of thing. That if we can put out there, then I think the, the powers that be on the public. And if it gets to the public, um, certainly that is going to make a very big difference. And also I think that our group should have PR persons, each group, and communication experts. Because remember, we have social media. That's free, you know. And we can put out what we have to say on Instagram and all over the place. Um, so we can have positive influence, getting the truth out. And the other thing I will say is that sometimes we have to take risks. And I'm not saying this lightly. Um, I have known of people, we all have known of people who have spoken out in Jamaica and have suffered in various ways. But I'm saying let us all, you know, support and speak together so that we don't have to have too much um, whistleblowers, so to speak, at, at, in threat. I hope this is helpful. Thank you very much, Dr. Allen. Thank you, too. From the interactions of the audience, I am sure you realize that the, your presentation was highly appreciated by us all. Um, unfortunately, no, everybody cannot ask questions for time constraint. But indeed, we enjoyed your presentation. We say thank you again on behalf of the world it's, family. It's a great pleasure and you're welcome. And we Sorry I'm on a lockdown, but yeah. I'm locked down, yeah. but I'm still not staying down. <laughs> All right. Okay. Oh, yeah. Our next presenter is Dr. Suarez popularly known as Dr. Susan Suarez Winter. Dr. Suarez is a clinical nutritionist and lecturer at the Caribbean Institute for Health Research. And she's also a director at the Heart Foundation for Jamaica. She specializes in weight management and is involved in, with research in helping to support healthy eating policies advocated by the Heart Foundation of Jamaica. She's here today on behalf of the Heart Foundation of Jamaica, and the topic she has to discuss with us is nutrition on, in COVID-19 era. So, Dr. Susan, we are pleased to have you, and I'm sure we are going to have a very good to, uh, discussion and interactive interactions as you see from the audience. So, the floor is yours. Hi, morning, everybody. Thank you very much for folks hanging around waiting for us. Um, so today I'll just be going through some of the effects or the impacts that COVID has had on nutrition and 
how it will affect you as family doctors, also how it affects how you relate to individuals, family, and also how it might impact how we move forward even in our professional practice. So I'll start, you should soon see my presentation coming up. All right. Great. All right. So, um, as was said before, I'm the clinical nutritionist at um, TMRU, Tropical Metabolism, here at CARE. And as, as is very obvious to everyone here, um, COVID is clearly having a major public health impact on everyone. And it, it just seems to be a moving target with different risk factors showing up depending on the country, depending on the individual, depending on the group. And it's very obvious that every one of us is at some level of risk. As a result of COVID, it's triggered a wide range of events um, that affects nutritional status in some way or some form or the other. So job losses, reduced income, uh, we do have increased in expenditures in families, um, people who are, you know, they're buying in bulk, buying way more than they would normally buy. We have school closures, working from home. If you didn't know how to do homeschooling before, now is the time that you're likely having to get a crash course. There are issues with staying home in that there are some areas and families that might have to deal with um, <laughs> domestic abuse and other issues of violence. We're all experiencing you know, this physical or what they used to term as social distances. Uh, distancing, we have curfews uh, and just general restrictions on movement which are more stark for others um, so in the elderly population, because their risk is higher, the restrictions are even greater there. So just, just trying to figure out when you must go to the supermarket or if you can go to the market. And we know that food, secure, food insecurity is on the increase, clearly with job losses, and especially for low-income families and for the elderly. So that's something that we are concerned about. And it, it's clearly obvious to all of us, we're here sitting with masks, um, looking, you know, trying to understand the stress of just how do you move about safely. Um, and it does have that psychological impact, which can have an influence on our diet. So how, how do we deal with COVID? Now, prior to COVID, we are already, already having we're facing an epidemic with obesity and non-communicable diseases. So we're already in some kind of crisis before all of this came about. Uh, we do have, we still have pockets of undernutrition. We clearly, not just in Jamaica, but across the Caribbean, have a high prevalence of overweight. And there's also that, what we term now that hidden hunger, where you may be overweight, but because there are micronutrient deficiencies. So, you know, we still lack iron or the quality of foods that we eat just aren't providing the essential nutrients then that's an issue for us and so just in the data the evidence that's coming up it shows that some of these issues are providing an increased susceptibility to severe COVID complications so this slide is really just going through some of the nutrition risks that are pre-COVID but also probably being enhanced even more as a result of some of the issues that I spoke about with COVID. So we know that diet and lifestyle are essential elements and they're modifiable risk factors of immunity. So, you know, having an, a heightened um, nutritional status or, or healthier nutritional status kind of puts you in a better position for your immune response to um, diseases like COVID. We in the Caribbean, we do have a high prevalence of type 2 diabetes. We have diets that are high in sugar, sodium and alcohol. As a result of COVID, we may be inclined to increase these even for, further. And we know that gut health may also have a predisposing risk. Food insecurity from the recent 
Jamaica Health and Lifestyle Survey done in 2016-17, it shows that a large majority of Jamaicans are already at food insecurity. Um, we generally have low consumption of fruits and vegetables. We are generally mostly sedentary. If you're now stuck inside at home and unable to go out and exercise or move about, just even occupational activity, many of us are more sedentary and we do have to find ways to become more active. Um, I put depression here and um, just attention to mental illness, which I know was mentioned before, but we already have between a 10 and 20% level of depression in the general population. And if you think of even in the elderly where the prevalence is much higher, then knowing that there you have to stay home for persons who live alone, unable to interact socially, even going to church or those other um, experiences will have an impact. So how does curfews and this physical distancing and social and work from home, how does it affect all of us? Well, the first thing is that we have a loss of our daily routine. So the time you may get up, having lunch just at work, dinner time, children are at home. So how do you control snacking? Um, the fridge is always there. There's a huge disruption in our usual eating and physical activity patterns. Um, from the psychosocial aspects, that increased anxiety, boredom, depression, just the uncertainty of when and where this will all end, can lead to emotional eating, skipping of meals. Um, if you look at what may be, you know, purchased in supermarkets, there's a, there are a lot of comfort foods. And even what is being promoted by a lot of manufacturers, it's a lot of comfort foods, you know, alcohol. How do you manage just the stress related, maybe insomnia or, you know, if, if you're having to mix both your social home life and work life all in one, how do you now plan for that downtime, especially if you were accustomed to a 95 job before? And we know that there's limited access and availability just of healthy products and services. Many doctor's offices are closed now or you know, have restricted access. Persons may just not be able to afford to do certain things or afraid to even go out and seek these things. One of the things that I want to mention, um, so it's very, you know, it's very obvious um, that a lot of industries of snack food, fast food, alcohol, tobacco companies have stepped forward. And, and yes, it, it does show that social responsibility to step forward and assist with this COVID um, response, because clearly we all have to do it in some way, shape or form. Um, but we have to be mindful of some of the tactics and you know, potential conflicts of interest with those of us in health. So we know that across the Caribbean, um, a lot of the rum and dis gin distillers are using alcohol now. They're shifting it towards fighting coronavirus with the implication development of hand sanitizers. We know that a lot of the beverage and food companies are, you know, helping to provide foods and beverages to um, those who are on the front line, putting it in the school feeding program. Um, but we have to be mindful of the type of product because if you think that with sugar, salt and alcohol can have an impact on even just securing your immunity for this kind of illness. And many of these products are products that we already had a problem in, in our diet um, which are causing our bigger problem of NCDs, then we need to kind of start looking at how we can protect the rights of consumers and even us as uh, health professionals. Because there can be negative implications of this level of marketing and profusion in the industry. One of the key things standing out is that just that brand recognition and marketing of unhealthy products. So just think about it. Um, if you in schools you know if in advertising hand sanitizers but it's uh you know you get children with school bags that have a rum branding on their school bag or 
in a school feeding program that it's you know known fast food packaging that it will impact to those persons who are in say a low income because it's now enticing exciting um, and yes it does help those low income students but then you know how how are we guaranteeing that the food that is being provided food and beverages are healthy it also will create uncertainty and controversy within the health field um, because in one instance they are appearing it's helpful um, so it's helpful in one instance but it is really going against a lot of the policies and so it can potentially undermine health messages and policies and there is an increased risk and exposure, especially for children and those vulnerable groups. So in keeping with WHO, PAHO, and just even other international policy action plans, one of the key things is really to protect the rights to safe and nutritious foods and beverages. Um, just ensuring that you know, control mechanisms are in place. So just starting at home, how you, what snacks you have available, um, ensuring that even children try and stick to a, a school schedule where you know you package snacks that they wouldn't normally have a free access to snacks and beverages at home at school and so you have to set up some kind of control mechanisms even on a personal level how often you go to the fridge um, when you do your exercise uh, looking at school and nutrition and beverage policies um, maybe looking at marketing regulations, especially for unhealthy product branding, um, you know, alcohol, tobacco, sugary drinks. And so it's very important to just familiarize yourself with um, maybe some of the hidden messages. How do you advise your patients? And even within your practice, how do you ensure that you maintain those policies and um, messages? So it's, it's very obvious that we're all going to have to get to um, fit in with a new normal, striking that balance um, with what exists, trying to get back into some sense of normalcy. Uh, so, you know, looking at food quality, ensuring that healthy snacks are available, familiarizing yourself with portion control, maybe becoming less reliant or dependent on ultra processed or fast foods. Um, we see a lot of farmers nowadays going towards you know we're helping the local farmers with local produce we have more time to actually assign to family meal time which is helpful not just from a nutritional and obesity standpoint but even just a psychosocial aspect and having a more health focused approach to our nutrition i want to particularly emphasize self-care um, because as family doctors um, and physicians and health professionals, because you're balancing so many hats at one time, it's very easy for you to put aside what's important for you. So trying to stay active <coughs> through all of this, um, you know, including aerobic and weight bearing activity. I heard one of the um, <coughs> guests speaking about mindful and intentional eating. So yes, being mindful when you go to the supermarket recognizing if you're really hungry and what it is that you're actually eating or drinking. Um, and being mindful that if you're not as active, then maybe you do need to be even more careful about how much you eat. And given the time that we may have um, and how we, you know, less having to <coughs> spend two hours in traffic, maybe now is actually the time to adopt or try new and healthier patterns. Um, and I just put two things here, I know the Jamaica moose, but there are many other things online that you can actually do. They're showing you how you can become fit within the home. I know many persons who didn't cook, cook before are now learning to cook <laughs> at home, which is a good thing. Um, but the last point here is really just to remember to take that break. It's, it's so important that rest is a part of that um, process with recuperation. We also have to think how we approach our patients um, and our health practices. So, you know, we may have to look at things like telehealth, telemedicine, how do you interact with patients online? There are several apps, um, applications that are available. Um, Zoom is one of them here. 
recognizing that we're leaning more towards e-commerce, online shopping. So understanding what the resources are out there for fruits and vegetables, for instance, recognizing online patient resources, professional and patient resources, because you you will be required to you know direct patients to very credible sources of information and um, if you didn't know how to do it before just having to trans translate things or communicate in an online manner then it may require you having to learn new ways of doing things um, which is very obvious uh, even us here at the university having to switch to now online teaching. So one of the things that we, I can start you off with, um, and it's a campaign that is being pushed forward by the Heart Foundation of Jamaica, is just pushing forward food labeling. So do you know how to read a food label? It's very easy to you know, try and learn it, um, understanding what the components are of a food label, serving size, portion size, what calories mean, how much fat it should be, um, and the sugars. And there are, very much, there are many online resources that you can look at. The Ministry of Health has um, information, as does the Heart Foundation, on how to read a label because it's something that you may be required to do and explain to your patients when they come in. We're also pushing forward things like front of package warning labels because we're in a society that maybe, you know, even as a nutritionist, food labels are somewhat complicated, but maybe just having a single front of package warning label may help advise persons on what is an unhealthy product, high in sugar, sodium, or trans fats. There are several health and wellness policies um, either being updated, being implemented, um, being created right now. Uh, the targets are really to improve a lot of the initiatives here in the Caribbean, fruits and vegetables becoming more active, promoting water, and good mental health, because that's something that not many people like to speak about. And also ensuring that there are restrictions to those unhealthy products. And so finally, just to say as family doctors, you know, you are essentially the ultimate role models. Um, so, you know, improving not just your self-awareness, but within your family and also your patient awareness, try and encourage and you're also practice healthier choices. Um, it does take uh, just one step at a time. It doesn't necessarily mean you need to all of a sudden have to be exercising one hour per day, but even starting 10 minutes is a big change. And definitely participate and contribute to many of the initiatives and health initiatives that are being put forward because the reality is that we're all in this together. Um, but that's it. So thank you very much. And hopefully we'll see each other again. Thank you. So we have a... Is any questions or... Yes. And Basel has a question. Mm -hmm. Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Doctor, for a very informative discussion, presentation, sorry. I'd like to find out, in terms of the daily maximum for sugar, as in sugar that you wouldn't want to exceed, what was the daily maximum that you think you would say that you should cut the limit off at? Well, the daily maximum, WHO has a daily maximum of um, nine for women, uh, nine teaspoons for women, 12 for men, but I think they're recommending for children to go down to as low as six teaspoons of sugar per day. Okay. Um, and that's added sugar. Okay, good. I was going to clarify. So if, it, if it's a, of course, you read the labels with the, with the baked goods, for example, a slice of bread. Correct. If you were to buy bread. So that is not included in the, the nine teaspoons, or you add it in it just so to say? The nine teaspoons is added sugars. So remember many products, um, fruits, vegetables, um, cereals, naturally have some amount of sugars in there. The, the challenge is really the added sugars. So many products will have um, added sugars, even as a fruit juice concentrate, for instance. So the, the regulations speak to added sugars. 
which would be excess because you don't you know you don't necessarily want to stop people from eating fruits yeah, yeah. <laughs> all right yeah, thank you so they're adding say honey as a sweetener because it's a sweetener it's not something you're going to pour a glass of a drink then right. that's where that concern is oh okay all right thank you so much Anyone else have any more questions? Yes, um, Maxine Cargill has a question. Maxine Cargill. Good afternoon, Dr. Suarez. Thanks very much for that um, explanation. I was piggybacking on the question about the daily amount of Sugar, could you give us the daily recommended amount of salt as well? Salt is, um, well, they have it as two, two, 2,000 grams, grams um, which really works out between one and a half teaspoons of salt, table salt, that is. Um, and in recognition that, again, most products naturally have sodium. And particularly here in the Caribbean, we are accustomed to a salty taste. We are accustomed to adding a lot of, most of our salt comes from a lot of our sauces, spices, seasonings that we add to food. Um, and, and it's like sugar, one of those things that the more salt or sugar you have is the more you desire that taste. And so you will keep adding it. And so it's, try to get people to reverse some of those behaviors like adding salt at the table, um, perhaps going for low sodium versions to help reduce that. And you know, some, some patients are easy with it to go in cold turkey, others um, you can have them do a step down sequential process where they just um, exclude certain things from the diet day by day. Thanks very much. And again, an excellent presentation. Thank you. Any other questions? No? Okay, well, thank you very much. And I hope that you'll all make sure to keep fit while we can. <laughs> Any other questions? No, I think I said no more questions, right? Okay. So, and yes, remember to eat those fruits and vegetables that we have. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Well, just one point I wanted to mm -hmm. make. Oh, there's one. Sorry, I hope it's not too late. In saying that, um, oh, sorry. Yeah. sorry, in stating that it's hard to get food, I would recommend that many people, because of course, it's easier to get fruits this season. Like, now that you have mango, it costs little or nothing. But when it's apple time, it's very cheap. When it's melon time, it's cheap. So if we eat the foods in season, it's very good for you. Are, you're absolutely correct. Um, so we so live in a tropical yeah. country, so there's usually no shortage of fruits no, and vegetables. No shortage. It's what is short um, is the knowledge of what to do. What is short is the behaviors that yes. help us to include fruits or vegetables. And you can start out gradually, um, little by little. Um, and yes, it's definitely cheaper, more economical, more feasible to include those that are in season. Right. That's it. Yeah. One more question. Um, Dr. Allen has a question. Oh, Dr. Allen. Um, according to Maxine Cavill. Well, Tony Allen has his hand up. I, I don't think that's Dr. Allen. Tony Allen. My apologies. Um, okay. Uh, so Tony Allen and Dr. Buckland. Okay, so let me I'll start then. Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> with fruits and vegetables being so expensive, um, the whole movement towards backyard gardens it seems to me that this is going to have to be a, a, a frontline business um, because 
as long as people have a like a piece of land, we need to exploit it. Uh, because especially with this pandemic and all of that. And we can even use paintings, tire, you know, or build a shelf against a wall and put pots on it with stuff. So the, the whole emphasis and give, give people little guidelines as to what's, you know, how to. How to. I, I want to know what you think of that. Uh, absolutely. Um, I actually forgot to mention it in my presentation because that's something that's very key even in the advocacy groups moving forward. Um, because fruits and vegetables are actually not as expensive as people think. I think many people may be religion to a lot of the imported fruits and vegetables. Um, but showing you know, getting back to those days where even within schools, it's something we have to build into the curriculum to show children, you know, maybe if they understand what it takes to even just grow a pea in a bottle, um, you know, and, and start doing more home gardens. We need to ensure that even within schools, it's, it's very common in the rural schools that they have, each school may have a school garden but that's something that maybe we need to ensure that all schools have in place and show the community involvement to ensure that um, those kind of school gardens can contribute to school feeding programs. For instance, we are now doing a lot of more multiple dwellings, you know, people living in apartments and townhouses where a space is restricted. So teaching persons how to grow, as you said, out of a paint can, can be very meaningful. And also communities, because if you look in cities like New York, they do have small plots where the community can come in. And it does have a big impact on especially food security within those groups. Um, there was one of the first. Dr. Buckland. Yes. Um, very good presentation. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, in, in looking at fruit peels, sometimes we peel an orange and then we discard the peel. And I was reading recently that an orange peel actually has three times the amount of vitamin C than the fruit itself. And, as, and I decided to experiment. So I cut a, an inch of the peel. I kind of dried it overnight. And and I brewed it. It was very delicious. Yes. Sir. Orange peel tea was really very delicious. And then after that, I ate the peel. It was quite good because, you know, it had taken, um, by brewing, it had taken a lot of the pungency right. of the peel. And so it's something we can look at because sometimes we tend to throw away even the better part of the fruit. So it's something to look at. Yes, well, um, if you're just going back on the concept of even the farm gardens, nowadays we shouldn't be throwing away anything because even if you don't eat the peel, it can go towards composting, which is very important in, you know, especially in cities where the soil might not be so good generally. But, but yes, um, depending on what, you know, depending on the, your taste, your appetite for certain things. Yes, there, there are several aspects of it. Um, if you go online, there are food composition databases that can actually tell you the nutrient and both macro and micronutrient composition of the different fruits and vegetables. And um, it's important for us to start exploring what, you know, we may be familiar with here, but in other countries, um, they eat other parts of the fruit that we would often discard. And so it may be something that we, we do have to explore, you know, and learn, learn new ways of doing things. So, so, so yes, that's, that's very good. And we do encourage even infused water for those of us who don't like to drink plain water, you know, and, and it does, if anything, add some kind of a flavor even if the taste isn't there. All right. So, so one more question from okay. N. Vassal. Hi, N. Vassal, you have a question? Oh, hi. Good afternoon again, Dr. Suarez. Uh, just one suggestion. It's, uh, because I see you may make in reference to gut health in the initial presentation. I do agree with you. And as someone who has had to develop, you know, 
measures to improve my gut health over the last year, I I just wanted to touch on, well, can you just suggest maybe that we can look at what fermented foods, how we, well, vegetables and fruits are great and fermented foods just um, concentrate the, 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 the probiotics in, in occurring naturally in those anyway. So yeah. I was just saying that, yeah, so us as family physicians may want to suggest it sometimes if patients are amenable to those methods and yeah, make it make Yes, and you know, you, yeah, you can be there. Very important. Um, yes, because even just if you're considering food storage, yes, you know? true. Yes, so it makes it last longer, right? All right, okay. thank you. Thank you very much. I think they have to continue. Dr. Suarez, we thank you very much. That was an excellent, well-researched, comprehensive, clear presentation. Thank and we had a little void was there. Questions and answers brought up what was left out. So I am sure that the audience was quite satisfied. And although we are apart, because of the virtual nature of the presentation, we are still together with the communications. So we thank you very much, and we hope that when we call on you next time, you do not say no. I'm sure we're going to call on you. Thank you very much. Our next presenter, ready? Our next presenter is one of us. Uh, who, she's a family physician and pharmacologist. She currently lectures in pharmacology and pathophysiology and complementary and alternative medicine at the University of the West Indies, Mona Campus. She's the author of a patient's guide to the treatment of diabetes mellitus. Her interest in pharmacology has led her to explore and embrace traditional and non-traditional methods of healing, an area where she has tremendous knowledge and experience. So she's going to speak to us on three arrows, rest, relaxation, rejuvenation, to be the best doctor. This is Dr. Jacqueline Campbell, and I'm sure you will all enjoy the presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, help us put your hands together for Jacqueline. Good afternoon, colleagues. Good afternoon, one and all. It's definitely a pleasure to be here to speak on this particular topic. I took the liberty of changing the topic and just a, just a little change. And so my topic is the four R's plus one A that you need to be the best um, to be the best doctor. Okay. Um, what is the other Aha. Uh -huh. That is the question, Dr. Ananujo. Yeah. So in terms, so the topic is family doctors, just a reminder of the topic, family doctors on the front line maintaining wellness in the COVID-19 pandemic. So my, my, my topic this afternoon is really to, to, for us to look at how can we be the best doctor but I'll set some framework to that. So what is the impact of COVID-19 on physicians? 
our speakers before this have touched on some aspect. The fact is that the full impact on physicians is not known. But I'll just go through some of them. We have the increased work demands and the stress in addition to the usual health delivery. There are the safety concerns for ourselves, our family, our colleagues, the fear and the feelings of this constant vigilance regarding infection control. I know that in the practice after each patient, I have to be there wiping down the seats everywhere that someone has touched and it really takes some amount of energy out of me. Speakers before have spoken about the feelings of isolation and stigmatization, especially I do believe Dr. Allen spoke about the stigmatization that some of our nurses faced. The shortage of necessary medical equipment and supplies. I'll pause here to share a little story with you that bleach is something that all of us have to be using. And what I was told a few days ago by staff in my practice is that look here, the quality of the bleach that they were getting is not really what it was before, that they sus suspect that the suppliers have been diluting the bleach. So I have an expectation of the bleach that I purchased, but that expectation is not being met. We have the adaptation to the change in the clinical environment. When um, just before COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, I was actually attending a conference in the U.S. Um, the Children's, uh, it was the Nicholas Children's Hospital Conference. And they spoke about the fact that this is not going to be harmful to children at all. Now, two months later, we find that in some instances, children are being affected quite, uh, quite negatively by this too. And also, there are the financial uncertainties that many of us have faced. There are the somatic symptoms which have already been uh, described in terms of what patients have experienced, but also we too, some of us have been experiencing the same. There's insomnia, scapegoating, and uh, a particular world leader is, is, uh, is well known for scapegoating, I won't get into that. The next one is uh, increased food intake, which other persons have spoken about. There's a well-known quarantine 15, which my cousins told me about this, where it's, uh, it's known that many persons actually gain about 15 pounds during quarantine time. And also, let us say, persons who are just entering college because you know they're not as active as before. And also the increase in terms of alcohol and tobacco use. The English call it a sort of Merlot madness. Many people drinking more red wine. And the de dehydration and exhaustion wearing protective equipment. I was just speaking to my colleagues before this, and I told them about yesterday when I was in the practice, I had on my lab coat over my clothes, I had on a mask, and I had on a face shield. I had to have on this face shield because of what I was doing, as actually helping to hold on some children who were being vaccinated. And also, I, I was looking into someone's throat. So we're looking at some impact on the physician. Now we're looking at wellness. We know the definition of wellness, a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease. On the other hand, the definition of health is the state of being free from illness or injury. Ah, yes, I'm getting all over the place, but there is a method to what I'm doing. Too many people wait until their health is severely impaired before they act. Or they think, well, I am fit and healthy already. Why fix it if it's not broken? We need to look at our physical health and our mental health. And um, in terms of our mental health, um, okay. 
Dr. Allen has spoken about this already and it's about physical health. I will just share with you a paper which I found on the prevalence of non um, in terms of the score, if your score is about five, it means that you have nine depression. I can go ahead. So in this paper, which was by by Purohit and Varma from India, they looked at non-communicable diseases in doctors. And here I've highlighted some aspects. The long working hours, occupational stress, sedentary work habits, the patient load, hectic lifestyle have all put a grave burden on doctors for, to end, for us to end up with a healthy, on a, a, a unhealthy lifestyle with habits of drinking, smoking, eating junk food, and lack of physical exercise, which is a reflection of what is happening in the general population. It goes further to say that doctors are educated and, are and they are aware part of society, yet their lifestyle and work habits have led them to suffer from non-communicable diseases. And even after knowing and treating patients with diseases, they end up becoming patients themselves due to their ignorance towards their own health. And it is time to take care of the ones who tirelessly take care of the rest of society's health. Now to be a good doctor, you first have to be a good human being. I just put this in for us to remember. I found this to be very interesting. I actually found a paper published by the British Medical Journal on the 10 most common qualities of a good doctor. And this is from the perspective of, uh, of doctors. Look at the 10 most common qualities. Compassion, optimism, courage, empathy, understanding, honesty, respect, humanity, competency, commitment. It doesn't end there. So that's the 10 most common qualities of a good doctor. There's more. In addition to that, a good doctor is also one who is attentive, creative, energetic, ethical, friendly, gracious, vigilant, wise. There's a long list there. It doesn't end there. So those are the qualities of a good doctor. What do patients want of us? The same article says that patients want little more than a doctor who listens to them. I think though that patients want a little bit more, they also want a competent doctor. We have other obligations. In addition to being good doctors, we have other obligations. We have our family, friends, community service, church service, hobbies, and the bottom I put self. I think it just naturally fell because of the order. And it was just so right because many times we put other persons above ourselves. So in other words, we have a lot on our plate. Self-care. <laughs> so we have a lot on our plate. It's actually a plate that somebody, a food that someone was about to eat and they sent it to me. And I, I ended up adding it here. Self-care and I will re-emphasize this, is not the same as being selfish. Remember that you have to take care of your basic needs. We have to ensure that we eat properly, we rest, we exercise. These things other, other speakers have touched on. We know that this may be challenging, but the fact, colleagues, is that if we are not well, we will not be able to take care of our patients. Also too, our patients look on us as the role models. So they're going to say, but this doctor's sick all the time. They will say things like that, you know, all right? They will say that. And 
we have to be, we have to remind them that we are human beings, we can get sick. But if we don't take care of ourselves, the patient's going to say, what sort of doctor is this that I'm going to? So good, better, best. So let us now look at the four R's and the one A that you need to be the best doctor. So the first one is going to be rest. We're looking at physical rest and mental rest. So physical rest and mental rest. We have to set up a framework for rest. In terms of the COVID pandemic, we have to accept that there are many aspects of COVID-19 that are totally outside of our control. This little virus, I said to people, this little invisible thing, we can't really control it. We have to focus on the things that we can 